You mentioned earlier that the Renaissance began a period of individualization, I guess you might say, a greater emphasis on the individual, which seems to be at odds with some of the classical notions you just mentioned. Uh, and obviously the founders were living in this period of Renaissance and Enlightenment, not the Renaissance, more the Enlightenment. Uh, well, what were the changes that they were exposed to in their time and how influential were they? Well, hugely influential, but where this is all going, to jump to the end for a second, is that we remain today a remarkable blend of both classical republicanism and this Enlightenment thought that we're going to turn to explore now. The Enlightenment absolutely turned classical principles on their head. The first writer in this tradition is Thomas Hobbes, who was the first social contract theorist. And Hobbes rejected the Aristotelian idea that we live by nature in political communities. According to Hobbes, the proper way to understand government and political power is to start with the individual, not with the community. He argued that human beings are not by nature social or political. Instead, he hypothesized that they originated in a state of nature that was totally lacking in government. What's life like for an individual in the state of nature? Well, Hobbes was just a wonderful writer, so I have to quote from him. In the state of nature, there is no art, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. In order to survive, people had to escape the state of nature and create an artificial state that could protect them. So, according to Hobbes, people agreed to give up the power that they had in the state of nature to a leviathan, sometimes called a mortal god, in return for peace and security. That, for Hobbes, is the social contract. Give up something to get something. Hobbes pioneered a radically new way of thinking about government. Government is necessary, but it is not natural. It exists only because people agree to it and consent to it. Hobbes laid the foundation for popular but authoritarian government. The Hobbesian Leviathan is the mortal god who maintains peace and order through a fear that is greater than the fear of violent death in the state of nature. Now, we Americans tend to associate more with the thinking of John Locke, another social contract theorist who wrote several years after Hobbes. Locke agreed with Hobbes that the individual, not the community, is the standard for judging whether government is legitimate. And he argued that individuals are best understood as originating in a state of nature. But, unlike Hobbes, Locke argued that all individuals in the state of nature were free, equal, and rational, and that they had fundamental, inalienable rights. That means they cannot give away those rights. In particular, they had the right to life, liberty, and property. Now, Property for Locke was a very broad term, and he described it in, in several different ways in his second treatise as including one's estate, labor, and freedom. The state of nature was governed by the law of reason, according to Locke. Nobody should harm anybody else in their enjoyment of their rights. Locke described the problem of the state of nature this way. Everybody in that state had the right to enforce the law of nature on everybody else. So, if you even perceived that I was going to interfere with your life, liberty, or property, you could exercise the executive power of the law of nature and kill me. The power of everybody to make those executive decisions about how to enforce the law of nature on others made the state of nature a very uncertain place, perhaps even a state of war. And because rights were not secure in the state of nature, people agreed with one another to give up their executive power of the law of nature and to form civil society. Locke's social contract was literally that, 
an agreement among people in the state of nature to leave the state of nature and to form civil society. Then, as members of civil society, they had to form a government that was capable of protecting their rights. Locke didn't prescribe a particular form of government best suited to protecting rights, but he did contend that legitimate government is based on consent. It has to be limited and it must protect rights. Government can be changed if the people decide that it's not protecting their rights. Now, what makes the study of our colonial roots so interesting is that the colonists were not thoroughly modern people. Social contract theory was brand new. The colonists had a long-standing history of British tradition and law and custom and the common law, and as the Declaration of Independence acknowledges, people do not change governments for light and transient reasons. So we see this, this struggle, if you will, between ancient forms of thinking about who we are and what we're like as human beings and the purpose of government and these radically modern ideas. Our ongoing challenge in the United States is to try to figure out the appropriate blend or balance between classical republicanism and natural rights philosophy.